Now, as humans, we tend to have the mentality that if we get away with something, then maybe we'll get away with it a second or even a third time. Like Boxbeck, Froster, Hildegard, Stenkamp, we like to test our limits. Stenkamp was recently convicted of stealing more than 500 million rand. In other words, half a billion rand from her foyer employer over time. In defrauding the company, she also defrauded SARS to the tune of 300 million rand. She stole the money over a 13-year period when she was employed there as an accountant. So why exactly do people commit these kinds of financial crimes and how do they get away with it for that long? Let's bring in Stephen Powell. He's the director for forensics at ENS Africa. Stephen, good afternoon. Welcome to today and thank you very much for your time. I mean, just an overriding question first. I mean, this is a huge chunk of money and it looks like uh, Ms. Tienkamp was doing this, I mean, over 13 years and she was never picked up until one point. So how easy is it to commit such corporate fraud? Dan, what we're dealing with here is an example of a pervasive type of fraud that is quite easy to commit and really difficult for companies to pick up. It does involve large amounts of cash and I think what assisted the accused in this matter, Ms. Stienkamp, is that the company was selling expensive equipment, um, medical equipment, medical devices, which run into thousands of rands, pacemakers, insulin pumps, etc. And they were dealing with massive revenues. So they didn't detect that the money was missing. But often we get asked to investigate by companies that say to us, Stephen, we're incredibly busy and we've got lots of orders, lots of customers, but we just are not profitable. We don't know where the bleeding is coming from. And that's where, you know, Dan, it's important for organizations to really be vigilant, to be monitoring their bank account and making sure that they've got independent oversight over the bank account so that they don't leave it in the hands mm. of one individual who can get up to mischief. From what we've seen in terms of the timeline uh, over the years is that it began uh, with small amounts that possibly could not be traceable or raise the red flag uh, in, in terms of, of whoever is monitoring the bank account. But over the years, the amounts grew and grew and grew until at once there was one million rand that uh, was with, with, withdrawn. So, so what can corporates do? I mean, because that seems to have been a failure, uh, at least in this case. Yeah, no, definitely, Dan. And, and what often happens with fraudsters is they test the waters. They start off with a tiny amount and they wait to see, has anyone picked up? Has anyone detected? So one of the key checks that I think companies have to make is they have to do an analysis of their vendor database and the bank accounts of all these suppliers and then match that against payroll to see what are our employee payroll bank accounts and do we have a match? You know, is there an overlap? And that's how a lot of corporates identify this type of fraud. And one of the key messages that I must also share with the viewers is that it's very easy to commit, we call it electronic funds transfer fraud. So what a financial person in the finance team will do is they will change the beneficiary's bank account so if, for example, they are going to make a payment and they're going to claim that this payment is for SARS, they will put their own bank account or their spouse's bank account. And I think many of the payments from Stenkamp went across to her deceased former husband. And when they make the payment, the company thinks we paid SARS or another supplier and it's a legitimate payment. What they don't realise is we're actually paying our own staff member and we're helping her to live a lavish lifestyle. It, and the lavish lifestyle is something critical as well, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, we'll talk about the lifestyle just now. But from what I've heard, uh, this also involved vet returns. So she would be siphoning some of those vet returns that were due to the company. Maybe, as you said, may, pretending like she's repaying them somewhere, like to SARS. Meanwhile, the beneficiary's account details have, uh, have changed. Would you recommend, Stephen, that... Uh, 
uh, in certain instances, companies should consider doing lifestyle audits. We talk about them a lot when it comes to politicians, when yes. it comes to public funds. We say, you know, government must do lifestyle audits so we can see if there's corruption. Would you recommend the same for corporates? Lifestyle audits are a critical tool, Ben, and we recommend it for government, for the public service, but we also recommend it for private companies. And many private companies out there are doing that. They subject finance teams, they subject procurement teams to lifestyle audits. And what is amazing is that fraudsters can't resist spending their ill-gotten gains. So they buy cars, they buy fancy houses, and when we do the lifestyle audits, I'm always amazed that you have an individual earning a small salary, but they've got three or four fancy motor cars, big four by fours, luxury vehicles. And when we look at the property portfolio, that is all public information. And the portfolio is there. There'll be properties either in the name of the, the perpetrator or their spouse. And it will be multiple properties. And when we look at how these properties are financed, there's no bonds, there's no financing. You know, so the question that companies need to ask themselves is when they see an extravagant lifestyle that doesn't make sense, you know, that's when they need to really start doing the checks. Because if they had done this early, the mm. number would have been far lower than the 537 million. Yeah, what other prevention and detection strategies you, you think companies should, uh, should consider? So, so Dan, I mentioned earlier that companies should be doing reconciliations of its vendor bank accounts and then cross-referencing and double-checking that those vendor bank accounts don't match employee payroll bank account details. So that's an internal audit check that should be routine. And if it's done, it'll throw out perpetrators of this type of fraud. We came across one just the other day, just a few months ago, Dan, where the perpetrator was a really popular, well-loved individual working in our client's um, accounts payable team. And what she did is she created a fictitious courier company and the company used multiple couriers to de deliver goods. And she just gave it a name that sounded very close to one of the existing suppliers. And it didn't exist at all. It was just a letterhead and a bank account. And she committed this crime for 20 years. And she was paying herself 70,000 rand a month for 20 years. And nobody picked it up. And how it was picked up was through this checking of the bank accounts, vendor bank account versus but, but the... But, but, but Stephen, I mean, after 20 years, I mean, here in this case with Mr. Stienkap, it was after 13 years, it looks like corporates, uh, 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 they, they fail somehow uh, to detect, prevent and yeah. detect such. It takes them too, too, too long. Is that common? It, it is unfortunately common. And Dan, you asked me earlier, you know, what should companies be doing? And that's where companies need to assess their fraud risks do a risk assessment, understand what the risks are, and then there are multiple areas where you can do proactive checks. And if proactive checks are done, you can identify these fraudsters at an early stage. It shouldn't ever be perpetrated for 13 or 20 years yeah. without detection. Okay, Stephen, final question to you, which maybe I should have started there. How prevalent or common is such fraud in business in South Africa today? Dan, you can see I'm tired. I don't get enough sleep at night. We are just flooded with fraud, and it's committed by different levels, CFOs, CEOs, financial directors, and various role players in accounts payable, financing, procurement, kickbacks, corruption, fraud, cyber fraud, cyber attacks, data breaches. These are the order of the day. We are living in dangerous times, and my last message, Dan, is companies have to protect themselves and do the fraud risk assessments and have a response plan. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. As we conclude, I have one wish for you for tonight. At least get some sleep. Thanks for talking to us this afternoon. Stephen Powell, Director for Forensics at ENS Africa.